Every Three Stooges fan has their own favorite stooge, from Shemp to Larry to Mo to even Joe. There was one member of the trio that, despite our own individual preferences, has always been accepted as the best, though. Curly Howard. <laughs> But you tell it to all the boys. The Rotund comic, with his high-pitched voice and fast-paced physical comedy, brought a manic energy to the act, one that could never be replicated, even by his Curly-esque replacements. How and how? <clears throat> There's a reason that Moe, Larry, and Curly are considered to be the most popular version of the Three Stooges. They all just complement each other so well, and each brought a different comedy style to the team. Previously on this channel, I profiled the careers of Larry Fine and Shemp Howard, the latter of whom I'm incredibly fond of. You say that to all the boys, I bet. <laughs> Just to you, dear. But even so, it's hard for me to argue against the opinion that Curly was not only the best third stooge, but also the best stooge, period. It's locked and we have no key. How are we gonna get in? How should I know? Use your head. Let me see. The golden era of Stooges shorts featuring Curly are some of the best comedies ever put to film, such as A Plumbing We Will Go. Yeah. Violent is the word for Curly. Punch Drunks. Oh, Ma. Doing the best I can, but I'm afraid it's not good enough. Have you seen Larry, Ma? Dutiful but dumb, just to name a few. Yeah. All of these great shorts contain sequences where Curly does his own thing, separate from Moe and Larry, which become remarkable showcases of his physical talent. Oh! He also synced with Moe and Larry in their scenes as a trio perfectly. Oh! That's a coincidence! And as skilled as he was at physical comedy, he was equally skilled at lightning-fast wordplay. I heard you traveled a lot. Are you familiar with the Great Wall of China? No, but I know a big fence in Chicago. No. He was simply a fearless performer. <laughs> and despite his large frame, he was pretty nimble. Yet, as the years went on, you can see Curly slowly degrade on screen. A heartbreaking display of a talent who poured himself into his work at the cost of his own well-being. Underneath the childlike character we saw on screen was a complex man who lived life almost as fast as his comedy. <laughs> Though he graced movie screens for just over a decade, he left a mark on film comedy that will stand the test of time. This is the story of an amazing talent that was taken way too soon. Jerry Curly Howard. I'm a victim of circumstance. Uh, who are you hitting? Oh, you're gone. <laughs> Curly was born Jerome Lester Horwitz on October 22nd, 1903 in Brooklyn, the youngest of five brothers, Irving, Jack, Samuel, and Moses. Gee, I wonder if I looked like that when I was delivered by the stork. When you were born, you were delivered by a buzzard. Oh, special delivery, eh? Called Jerry by his friends, he was nicknamed Babe amongst family members due to him being the youngest. Jerry grew up idolizing older brothers Mo and Shemp, who started performing together at a young age, adopting the stage names Howard and Howard. At home, Jerry was often the brunt of his brother's havoc, not unlike the character he would later play on screen. Oh, what Jack the Ripper, eh? Hitting little girls! Yeah. Oh. Oh. 
While he didn't excel at school, he displayed a great athleticism and love of sports throughout his youth. His first major brush with trouble came as a result, though, when at age 12, as he was cleaning a hunting rifle, to the hunt! To the hunt! To the hunt! Ooh, to the... he shot himself in the foot. It feels like a bit right out of a Stooges film, but the reality was a lot grimmer. The injury resulted in a lifelong limp, one you can make out on screen in many Stooges films. I'm a victim of circumstance. By the time he was a teenager, though, Jerry developed a new interest in life. Women. He was married more times than any other Stooge, four in total. As a young man, he prided himself on dressing well, which combined with his sense of humor, thick head of hair, finely waxed mustache, and athletic build made him quite the ladies' man. I'm going to rumple your hair. <laughs> with two of her sons traveling the country performing on vaudeville, Jerry's mother Jenny became increasingly protective over her youngest son. This caused Jerry to rebel, often seeking refuge at local nightclubs, where he surrounded himself with the best food and drink available. <laughs> Champagne! And so the once athletically built Jerry Howard started to develop a round physique that would become one of his trademarks. Well, if you didn't have TB, I'd be able to get this around you. What do you mean TB? Two bellies. Oh. In 1929, he was heartbroken to watch Moe and Shemp embark along with their new partner Larry Fine to Hollywood to shoot their first movie with their then ringleader Ted Healy. Feeling both envious and inspired, Jerry used the experience to finally make the leap to showbiz against his mother's wishes. He started out as the leader of a comic orchestra, though deep down he really wished to be on the road with his older brothers. Less than three years later, Jerry would get his wish, though. In 1932, after years of turmoil, Shemp could no longer take Ted Healy's volatile behavior and split from the act. A replacement was needed as soon as possible, and Moe suggested his younger brother to Ted. Upon meeting Jerry, Healy had one stipulation if he was to join the act. He must shave his head. Jerry, according to Healy, looked too normal compared to Moe with his spittoon haircut, and Larry with his frizzy locks. Jerry prided himself on his thick head of hair, but in the end his desire to be a part of the act outweighed his pride. He shaved off his hair, though his mustache remained temporarily and can be viewed in early promotional photos. Although it was something he was never comfortable with, he kept this new style to benefit the act. It remained the rest of his tenure as a stooge. Oh, 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 oh. Ooh, I got a little soap on my tongue. Yeah. Yeah. The last element needed to complete his transition to the Stooges was a new name. Larry Arilay. Mo Ome. Curly Curlicue. Hold him, hold him, hold him. There's been a lot of theories surrounding how Jerry became Curly. Some sources claim upon seeing his shaved head for the first time, he declared, ain't I Curly? While others state it was Ted Healy who coined the name. This always seemed like urban legend to me especially considering that his name appears as Curly, spelled C-U-R-L-E-Y in the first Stooges shorts. Another theory is that he earned the nickname from vaudeville actor Frank Curly, father of actress Rose Marie, who also spelled his name with E-Y. That's a coincidence. Whatever the reasoning may be, the name, along with his shaved head and round frame, became instrumental in his transformation to his comic character. Like his brothers, he adopted the stage dame Howard, and Jerry Horwitz became Curly Howard. Listen, Curly, when he throws a punch, don't forget, duck! What? I say when he throws a punch, don't forget, duck! <laughs> I forgot to duck. Though he first appeared with Moe, Larry, and Healy on stage, Curly officially debuted on screen as part of Ted Healy and his Stooges in 1933, with them often billed as Howard, Fine, and Howard. Watching the early Stooges film work is like watching a band before they find their sound. I'm the Dean. You hear me? The Dean. 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 You're a better man than I am, Gong the Dean. They only serve to highlight why the trio would soon break from Ted Healy, as he got most of the spotlight, though the funniest bits came from Mo Larry and Curly, something critics even wrote about at the time. Little fly upon the track. The train came along and broke his back. They made their final appearance with Healy in 1934's Hollywood Party, before they signed a deal to headline short subjects for Columbia Pictures beginning that same year. Success! Mm. I'm poisoned! Previously in my video on Larry Fine, I discussed how their first short for Columbia feels nothing like the Stooges we know today. But by their second, Punch Trunks, they fell into a rhythm that would remain the rest of their careers. What was going on about? 
What's the idea? Punch Trunks is a showcase of not just the newly independent Three Stooges, but also the immense talent of Curly Howard. His antics carry the short, which revolves around Curly becoming a boxing champion after going crazy every time he hears Pop Goes the Weasel. <laughs> Curly became a much more confident, daring performer now that Ted Healy was gone. Moe stepped into the role as leader effortlessly, Larry became the instrumental middle stooge, but Curly transformed into a comedic tour de force, a one-man show of different characters. How are you, tall and handsome? I'm glad you come up to see me. <laughs> and mannerisms. And of course, sounds. Curly brought an infectious energy to the Stooges' comedy. He was a master improviser, and you can clearly make out the genuine laughter of the supporting cast during some of his bits. Soon, a series of running gags was established with his character, such as his seemingly indestructible noggin. Oh, look! Oh, 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 look! Oh, 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 look! There were also his battles with inanimate objects. and his simple yet hilarious retaliations against Mo. <laughs> As Deers went on, Curly continued to refine his craft, displaying a seemingly endless amount of energy in each varied short. Like when he played dual roles as Curly and his father. Ma sent us here to keep you from marrying that blonde. And I aim to do it too, that's what I aim to do. I aim. <laughs> Quiet. <laughs> this is even more impressive considering that in between filming shorts, the Stooges were touring and performing their act live on the road. When he wasn't working, Curly could be found entertaining his family or letting loose at a nightclub. Though his first marriage ended in a quick divorce in 1931, his second marriage produced a daughter. But that marriage would also soon end in divorce in 1940. Though he loved his family, one of his true loves was his dogs. After achieving fame, Curly was never without a pet canine, or two, or three, usually rescuing strays and adopting puppies of all different breeds. You can see his affection for them in many of their shorts. Did anyone ever tell you you had pretty paws? But you shouldn't bite your nails. It's an example of how he lived to excess. One of anything was never enough for Curly. Despite the success they were achieving, Curly was struggling behind the scenes, though. It was not unusual for a child fan or young person to encounter him out in public and playfully smack or hit him in the way that was done in the shorts. Though Curly was always a good sport, the pain was real. This combined with his second divorce led to Curly developing a reliance on alcohol. As the 1940s began, he found himself spending late nights at the clubs and would then show up on minimal sleep for shooting the next day. This is where you can first start to notice a difference in his performance, with him gradually losing that once fast-paced comic delivery. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> Occasionally, he would bounce back, but his performances were mostly inconsistent from short to short during this time. What's the matter with you? You want to fall off? Gee, thanks. You know, a guy can get killed from up here. In 1945, worried about his health, Mo made an appointment for him at a private hospital. The findings were grim. Curly had high blood pressure, hypertension, a retinal hemorrhage, and signs of heart damage. Mo urged him to take a rest, but it would have to be short-lived, as the Stooges had contracts they had to fulfill. 
To complicate things, Curly married again that same year, though they would separate just months later in early 1946. Slandered in the gossip columns and still grappling with health issues, Curly reached his breaking point. While filming Half Wits Holiday, his 97th short, he suffered a severe stroke. Delighted. Devastated. Dilapidated. The lack of incoming salary combined with his medical bills, alimony payments, and child support diminished the savings that he had. Fortunately for him, older brother Shemp returned to replace him in the act, and he, along with Mo and Larry, gave an equal share of their paychecks to Curly. <laughs> You're all right. Come on, Despite the odds against him, Curly's health began to improve, though. Shemp's second tenure was supposed to be only temporary, with Columbia even just pasting his photo over Curly's in the opening credits. Oh, there I am, and as pretty as a picture. Yeah, but Nate, oh, get gone. Curly even felt well enough to visit the set during the production of Hold That Line in 1947, resulting in this memorable cameo. <laughs> What is that, a cocky spaniel? Oh, I think it's just a spaniel. He cut down on his drinking and began to eat more healthily. He even married again, this time to Valerie, whom he met in a nightclub. Val, as she was nicknamed, became the loving wife he had been seeking his entire adult life. She gave birth to their daughter, Jane, in 1948, and Curly appeared truly happy for the first time in years. <coughs> Moe even arranged another cameo appearance for him in a Stooges short, in Malice in the Palace, as a chef though the scene was later deleted. Today, only this promotional still survives. Unfortunately though, Curly suffered a second stroke shortly after and his condition deteriorated rapidly. Confined to a wheelchair, he spent the next few years at different sanitariums before succumbing to his ailments in 1952. He was just 48 years old. Take custard for mine. Oh, custard! Sweetly! <laughs> and now everything is all Jay. Oh, it's all Jay! While I will always have a deep love of Shemp Howard and the work he did for the Stooges, it's undeniable that Curly was simply irreplaceable. His loss is something that the Stooges could never overcome fully. It's impossible to disassociate Curly from the Three Stooges, but during his solo scenes, we see just what a massive talent he was. On par with some of the great silent clowns. Come on. What's wrong with the head? Even though his later shorts can be tough to watch, you can always sense that he's giving it his all, and truly loved being a part of the Three Stooges. It must have been incredibly hard for him to step back, and watch the act continue on without him. I only wish today he could see just how beloved he is. As I said in the intro, we all have our own favorite Stooge. But we all accept that only one of them can be the best. And I think we can all agree that it's Curly. I'm a victim of circumstance! I'm going to Oh, she has fainted. Get her a glass of water. No whiskey. No, 